said, yeah, that's terrible. Good morning. morning. That's better. Now turn to your neighbor and say, it's nice to see you in church. Just say hello to somebody and bid somebody a welcome. And if you don't know who it is you're talking to, then say hello to them and say, it's lovely to see you here. It's a joy for me to be with you. Thank you very much, good brother, for your very kind words of welcome. And also to your pastor, Pastor George, for his invitation to come along and to share in your morning service. Many of you are aware, many of, some of you might be aware, some of you might not be aware, but I represent this organization right over across here called Gospel Mission of South America. And the work of Gospel Mission of South America really works in three countries called Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay. And that's our mission right, just right down on this wee board right down the front here. And that's our mission family. We're not a big family by any means. We're not a big mission family, but we're grateful for the missionaries that God has sent our way. What missionaries that have been very clearly called of God to go to these countries of Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay to share the good news of the gospel of Christ. Now, we're very, very aware that men and women need to hear. We're very, very aware that without missionaries going, how are they going to hear? And we're grateful for folk who will go not just to South America, but to other parts of the world, people who have been called of God and people who very clearly know that this is where God wants them to go. Maybe even over this week of meetings, of missionary meetings, the call of God might even come to your life. And it might not necessarily mean God calling you to go to some other country or some other continent, but God might even call you to work for him in this very community where God has placed you. And then on the other hand, it might be completely different because you might be already serving in this local community and God might indeed prompt you to move on to go somewhere different where you haven't yet been, but God has burdened your heart for it. I'm going to show you a little DVD really about our, just very quickly, a wee introduction to some of our missionaries and some of the things that they encounter, whether it be as a parent, bring up children in the mission field, or whether it be a different perspective. And it's about seven minutes long, and just you sit and you watch along. And then I'm going to try and then take you down to a place called Argentina, and we're involved in a camp centre there, but we'll speak to that in a little moment or two. Just you listen along, and hopefully everybody should be able to hear it clearly. Because they're working, because they're away, and most likely they will be 
And that's a huge challenge when leading yourself to the Lord, of course, but those are the challenges that we're facing in the desert city of Allah. I believe there are some challenges that we face as a missionaries on the field. It's sometimes loneliness, sometimes you feel alone, because when you go into a new city, you don't know anybody. You begin to make a new contact. So sometimes it can be loneliness, sometimes it can be uh, impatience. Uh, sometimes you want things to go faster. Uh, but you have to just the way of the Lord for those times to uh, bring the harvest. As far as some of the areas that are a challenge, or perhaps uh, a little bit of a discouragement, sometimes in the ministry, is the lack of a response from people to the Word of God. We spend so many hours investing in people's lives, helping them with their problems, uh, and then uh, they get their problems resolved temporarily, and they don't come to church or they don't see you until the next time that there is a problem. And so that sometimes discourages us, but obviously we need to know that God has called us, and there's going to be times of trouble, there's going to be times of discouragement, but if you know that the Lord has called you to do a job, He's also going to provide in His timing the solution to the problems as well, so all we have to do is continue to be faithful to God's calling in our life. Uh, probably the biggest answer to prayer that uh, we have had in our ministry has uh, been the Lord's preparation, His provision in us coming to the field. Uh, you know, we, the Lord guided us and gave us direction and uh, where He wanted us to go and, uh, and then He provided a way for us to come here. It, it took several years for us to raise our support, uh, but it was all in the Lord's timing and we really sensed the Lord working uh, through all of that. Uh, part of that preparation was really preparation for us to be ready for the field, preparation for our children uh, to be here as well. And uh, so the Lord doesn't always answer our prayers in our timing, but He certainly does answer our prayers and we're thankful for the Lord and how He provided for us in His timing and uh, we're certainly not in our timing. So we're really thankful for that. In church, I play the guitar and work in the nursery. And I really like doing gymnastics. I enjoy working at a camp in Santiago Pique. Um, I also enjoy playing soccer and uh, drinking mate. One thing I like from being a missionary is that I can serve the Lord with my family at church. My name is Lois Kenny and this is Lois McAllister and we have served the Lord between us um, 81 years and we're serving the Lord here because we love Him and we've given our lives to Him to Church planning is Christ building his church through those who have surrendered their lives to his service. It's God's servants making disciples, resulting in churches being established. This is Pastor Bill Hickson, and my wife Linda and my daughter Andrea, our fourth child. We're enjoying the Calvary chili and the beautiful weather here and being here with the missionaries. And we partnered with GMSA for over 45 years. It's been my privilege to know this mission and many of the missionaries, especially the first generation that gave such a great heritage to the mission for sacrifice, service, love, and humility. And it's been my privilege to be on the board since 1989. And I've been able to make trips down here many times uh, during since that time. Uh, and we've had great joy in seeing the churches uh, that God has raised up in Chile and Argentina and Uruguay, camp ministries and the Bible Institute ministries. We've had great joy in, in seeing pastors that are well trained and serving the Lord. And so we feel GMSA is a good investment for God's people, for their prayers and their support. And actually, my experience is the mission is getting stronger and better. Uh, and that's a rare thing in these days. So 
We're glad to recommend the Gospel Mission of South America and missionaries that are on the job and do the job and get the job done by God's grace, partnering with your churches to serve the Lord in the Southern Column in Chile, Argentina, and in Europe. for those of you who do pray for our work and pray for our missionaries. It's just some of our missionaries making a comment, making reference to, uh, as we, I was out with them back in January, I had the privilege of being out on a, on a field trip in Argentina. I was there from the 13th of January to the 2nd of February of this year. And uh, one of the main purposes of going there was going to our, fa our missionary conference. Uh, it was going to take a little while to get there. I'm not used to, back here in Northern Ireland, you're used to rising early in the morning, but you're not used to sitting in a car for 10 hours in one day. Uh, but that's a very common thing uh, for us to get from one mission station to another, from a place called uh, Chivlicoy in Argentina, to travel down into, uh, into Chile in Lican Rey. It was going to take us 10 hours, 1,000 miles in two days. We would drive right across the Andes. It would take us out across some of the most, uh, well, driest, barrenest places. And yet while we would travel by, we would see scenes of spiritual darkness where people who are literally still in darkness, whereby the light of the truth of the gospel has not yet dawned on their heart. People who have set up little crosses, little relics along the way to pray for the dead and to pray for those who have passed away in a specific place. But most of all, sadly, one of the saddest things is many of these folks still have not yet understood or even fully heard the gospel. This good news that you hear on a weekly basis, not just on a monthly basis or maybe even a yearly basis, but on a weekly basis, many of these folks have never yet heard. It would take us across the Chilean border and we'd sit here because of a, sadly because of a, uh, there's a bit of an influx of people going into Chile uh, to buy articles a lot cheaper than Argentina and would see us sitting in the border for, the, for nearly on for four to five hours. And they're talking about the border between the north and the south. How is people going to survive crossing the border? Well, this is done every single day, these crossings, and it survives in these countries. And yet this reality was it would take us into Chile. It would take us down into Chile and some of the most beautiful scenery that you could see. But one of the main purposes for us going there was really just to spend time with our missionary family take some time in prayer because as missionaries we come together as a family once a year usually either we'll come once a year in uh, once in january time uh, in in chile and then another year in uruguay and then god willing in time we will come to argentina so every january our missionaries some will travel as far as 30 hours one way and they won't even have left the country of chile Others will have traveled 15 hours and will have come as far away, for, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, but maybe more, maybe, maybe about up into 20 hours and come across from Uruguay. But the purpose of us coming together is to spend times in prayer because we are conscious as a mission, we're very conscious, our missionaries, we know personally, our mission family, we know how much we need prayer individually. Not just do we need prayers from the, God's people, but we need prayers even, the, even uh, ourselves personally. But also would take times of praise because as, as a mission family would spend some time just worshiping the Lord and, 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 and be able just to enjoy his presence. But also with an opportunity to spend times in the word because one of the purposes for our missionaries coming together and spending time as a mission family is very much is for them to be fed, for them to be encouraged. You come to church every Sunday and your pastor faithfully endeavors to spend time in the word in preparation so he might be able to break forth the bread of life. Well, our missionaries are more or less doing what your pastor is doing every Sunday to their congregations. So it gives them an opportunity to sit in the congregation and to listen to the word being preached. And this past year, we had two speakers, Pastor Hickson, who you heard in the last wee video report, and also another fellow from Bob Jones University who came to speak to our missionaries. And it was a time for us as missionaries for encouragement, for edification, but also for correction, because that's what God's Word does. It corrects us, it edifies us, uh, and it encourages our hearts just where we're serving the Lord. But I want to try this as well, just simply to take you across 
God willing, and to just very simply highlight, highlight one thing that's a sort of a, 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 a major thing in our calendar here in the UK, and that is God willing, a work trip to Argentina next year. You'll see the little banner over to your left. You'll also find little, little handbills out in the foyer, which are exactly the same bar the pictures on the bottom. And this really just simply em emphasizes, God willing, next year we're taking a work, trip, work team to Argentina for two weeks. We're going in the end of May and the first week of June, and it's part of my role to sort of coordinate that and to go along. So far, we have one person signed up along with myself, and we're God willing, we're going to work in our camp center whereby we're endeavoring to, uh, whereby we're endeavoring to see a camp center developed whereby it can be used for many different tools. Uh, our work trip will be going primarily to work along with this couple called James and Danielle Morell. They're called the Morell family. You'll see them all there. You've got Hannah is the oldest daughter, Jamie, Sheldon, Josie, Matthias, and Sophia. And God called them back in uh, uh, 2009. And by the time they didn't get to the mission field of 2014, and God called him specifically to be our camp director to see development. He was like a building contractor in America uh, and so forth. But God called him to give up his business and to set that aside and just simply to go to, the, to go to the southern cone of Argentina to be involved there in our camp center. Our camp center is based in a place called Chivlico in Argentina. This is one of the dorms that we went to build, and uh, a dorm sleeps 48 people. And then also we find that uh, we have a number of other facilities that we're, God is blessing, but this one over here is going to be our second dorm. you see it just in underneath the trees, and that will again facilitate another 48 sleepers. And then, God willing, we're, and we're going to build a swimming pool and then another two dorms on top of that. So it'll be another 96 sleepers that they can come along and sleep. So all in roughly about, about, 100 and, about 198 people will be able to sleep at the camp. Uh, we're grateful to God for this facility that God has blessed us with. It's 20 acres of ground that was bought about 15, 14, 15 years ago. It was just an absolute plain, plain sight, clear, clear field. And, and over time, as God has provided, as God has provided the means, we've endeavoured to build a caretaker's home on it. We've endeavoured to, to build a workshop on it. We've endeavoured to build a, 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 the dining room, kitchen, kitchen dining room, and the meeting room with a little barbecue area. The first of our dorms, and God willing, we're going to endeavour to pursue and, and see how these endeavour to pursue this a little bit further, and just to see this camp centre developed. I'm not sure how interested you might be in coming along, board, uh, coming along with us and getting on board and just to see this centre develop. But we are very, very grateful to God for the way he has provided, the way he has seen how this, how this development has, has come on. We're grateful for this year for the very first time. We've had our very first men's conference back in May when pastors and men came together for two days. And it was the very first time the facility was used. We'd like to see this facility used to an even greater extent, and our missionaries are very much burdened to see this, this development taken to another extent, whereby we can now begin to bring in children, young people, adults, camps, parents and, parents and children, family camps, father-son retreats, mother-daughter retreats, just means whereby, and also, also God willing, this facility will be used as a Bible institute. Uh, in Argentina, God willing, there's a missionary at the present stage who's in, in Texas uh, studying the language, but God has called him to set up a Bible institute on this very site, and we want to see this developed. And so one of the, one of the burdens that I have at this present stage uh, here in the UK is just to try and endeavor to just inform you about this center, just inform you about what God is doing, and just inform you how God has wonderfully provided so far, but how that we are in need of people who would be willing to go, and maybe people who don't feel that they're gifted in evangelism, or gifted in preaching, or gifted in, maybe even in children's work, but God has blessed you with the gifts of hands, and you're willing to use your hands to serve the Lord in another place. Can I encourage you indeed on the way out that there is some of our little news, these little, uh, in, these little, what would you call them, little just news sheets just telling you about, just telling you about our, our, our plans for next year, God willing, and we'd love you to take one. And even if this does not interest you, as it were, that you think, well, I know I couldn't actually go personally, maybe you would pray that God would provide the means or the men and the men and the woman that would be willing to come and serve the Lord with us for these two weeks, God willing, in May. Uh, as I said, our camp center was used for the first time uh, uh, for a men's retreat back in, in May time. 
and we're grateful for this opportunity. We had a Lyft team who went out with us. I don't know how many of you know about the organization called Lyft Labour and Faith and Trust. They're based in Belfast. And many of these men and women who just simply give up with their time to go and serve the Lord. And we are grateful for the team that God sent, willing to serve the Lord. And uh, just back in May of this year, uh, and this was the team that went out, there was only four. I'm not interested in a massively big team. I'm just interested in people who are willing to go and serve the Lord and do whatever they're asked to do. And, and so if you're willing to be part of that, we would be delighted to have you. We'd be delighted to have you come on board. Very quickly, can I just say to you, I want to thank you very much for, for your practical and prayer support here at Kilkeel for the work of GMSA. We are grateful to God for folks like yourselves who not just pray for us, but also support the work. And I know, and I'll speak on, I speak not just on behalf of myself, but on, indeed on behalf of all the missionary organizations that will come over this next week. Uh, they will be grateful uh, to you for their prayers for them and for the work that they're involved in. And if you are praying for a mission organization, I would encourage you to keep on praying. We'd value your prayers, Karis and I, as we serve the Lord here in the UK. But if you'd like to know more about our work, can I just say something to you? There's a wee mailing list out in the foyer. We will not bombard you with, with literature by any means. I, whenever I go, I try to tell people about the two, ba- the two Bs. We'll not bombard you and we'll not beg of you for money because there's a mission we believe that God provides for his people and he provides in his own way. And, uh, and so that's two things that we will not do. Uh, but what we will do is we will in, in ask you, just encourage you to, to pray for our missionaries who are serving the Lord presently in Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay. I know from them, they would like to say something to you. And on their behalf, they would just simply say these words. Sorry, have we any volume? Brilliant. And, and that, they meet, our missionaries mean that now this morning. It's not just words to them. Literally, they do want to say thank you for their prayers, gracias, because they know that without your prayers and the prayers of many people, not just in Northern Ireland, but in the States and Germany and other places where our missionaries are being supported and prayed for, they are grateful for folk who take time and remember them. Our, our last newsletter is sitting out in the foyer. We'd really value if you want to take one with you don't want you, we're not here to try and take somebody else's place in your prayer diary or your prayer calendar. But if, you're, if there's a, a space where you're able to fit in our GMSA family and say, look, we, I would like to pray, take time to pray for your mission family and pray for your missionaries, then we'd be delighted if you come on board with us in this end and we'd be grateful to God. Uh, we're going to turn our Bibles this morning for our, just for a few moments this morning as we, as we bring uh, the, this part of our service to close to, to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6, as already has been intimated in our opening prayer from our brother, there was that, very much that response from Isaiah, uh, which many of us will know off by heart. Whenever, in, uh, whenever verse 8, whenever the word of the Lord, whenever Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord, and he says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah's response was then, said I, uh, here am I, send me. Uh, let me just read to you the first few verses of Isaiah 6 and then just share a few thoughts together around this word. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up on his tree and filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he, he did fly. And, uh, uh, oh, sorry, with twain he did cover his face, and with twain he did cover his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door opened, moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the servants unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off his altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. 
In, back in the year 20, in, the, in 1963, on the 28th of August, a man stood in America, uh, on, uh, on, uh, in America, his name was the late Martin Luther King, and he said these words, he said, I have a dream uh, that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. He said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Now, whether you agree or disagree with the late Martin Luther King, I'm not here to dispute that factor. But what I am here to speak about very simply is that, very simply share with you as part of an introduction, is that the late Martin Luther King was not, not only a dreamer in the right sense, but he was a visionary, and that he was a man who endurably endeavored to look toward the future to see how he would like to see his children being brought up, how he'd like to see the country in which he lived. He'd like to see people in the culture in which they were associated with, whereby there wouldn't be this vast divide between the man's color or man's creed or man's nationality. It would make no difference to him, but that he would see all men as equal and all men as one. And so, and really I'm going to say to you this morning that Luther was one of those men who was a visionary man. Chuck Swindle says these words, he said, vision is essential for survival. It is spawned by faith. It is sustained by hope. It is sparked by imagination. It is strengthened by enthusiasm. It is greater than a sight, deeper than a dream, broader than an idea. Vision encompasses vast vistas outside the realm of the predictable, the safe and the expected. He said, no wonder, he says, we perish without it. And will it be for you locally here in Kilkeel Baptist Tabernacle, or will it be for our missionaries who are serving the Lord, will it be in Chile, Argentina, or Uruguay? Can I say something to you? The reality is that without vision, sadly what happens is we just merely go through the motions, we go through the routines, we go through the routine, we go through the rituals of just life. It's vision that, that is needed for every area of the work of God in this very, this very tabernacle where God has called many of you folks to serve the Lord, where God, God has called, whereby this is the place where you call home, whereby this is the place that you call your fellowship, whereby this is the place where you where hang your hat up at the, or hang your coat up at the door and say, this is my church. This is the place where I believe that God wants me to be. And really, if, we don't, if we're in a place and we don't feel this is the place we should be, we need to get to a place where we know we need, where God wants us to be. And then whenever we are at the place where God wants us to be, it's saying that we've got to get our hands to the work and our feet to the work and our bodies put our, our lives into the work because we realize, folks, that there are people who need... The reality is that no matter where you go in the work of God, there's always a lack of one thing. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray ye there for the Lord of the harvest that he may send forth laborers. And over this week you will hear of mission organizations who will come to you and the burden will be, Lord, that you would send us more laborers. And we look across, I can introduce you to a young couple called Death and Alison Marshall who've just recently arrived in Argentina back in April time with their little three-month-old baby. And God has called them to be involved in church planting in a city where there is no presently, where there is no evangelical witness of the gospel. And they are a young couple to whom that God has burdened their hearts to leave their homes, to leave their families, and go to a country that they don't know of. They've been in visiting on many occasions, but don't actually know the fault. They're trying to learn the culture, have learned the language, but are going into a city that has not yet, for many of them, have not yet even had a, an evangelical church in it. Not to say they're not churches, not to say they're not places of worship, but what I'm saying to you is a place whereby it is evangelical and fundamentally Bible-believing. Now, we are blessed, folks, in Northern Ireland. We are blessed in this country that we live in. You are blessed in this fellowship. But the vision is essential. It's essential for the children's work. It's essential for the youth work. And sometimes you, people put emphasis on the children and the youth, but the reality is we dare not forget, we dare not forget the old people who have sacrificed and given generously to the work of God, people who support the work, people who stand with the work in prayer. The fact is all aspects of the ministry must not be neglected. It's not that one aspect of the work is more important than our work, all our work. I recently sat in a meeting, this man emphasized, well, all your, really, you should put the majority of your resource in the young. Well, I have to admit, I don't necessarily agree with that. 
Because I believe that all aspects of the work deserve our, res our resources. Because the fact is, there, there are people who today, see old folks sitting in homes on their own, and they're just longing for somebody to give five minutes of their time and say, to just to sit down and, and make a wee cup of tea and a bit of a yarn and a bit of a crack with them. That's all they're looking for, just a wee bit of time. Somebody give time to them. But people who have vision to see, Lord, you haven't called me to work with the children. Lord, I don't feel minute, as if my talents, my gifts are with the young people. But God has given every one of us talents, gifts, and abilities. And we've got to find out what those talents are, and we've got to use them. Well, I, I want to just simply try and draw your attention for our, just for a couple of seconds here, a few moments just here, around why this vision is essential. In the year King Isaiah died, Isaiah received this vision, and it was a fresh vision of the Lord. It says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. He said these words, and, uh, high and, uh, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his tree and filled the temple. Verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, you may indeed wonder why does Isaiah make reference to this King Uzziah? Well, Uzziah, the, many will say, was a, a great king in Israel, a good king in Israel. Uh, there are those who believe that he was the last great king of the southern kingdoms of Judah. Uh, through him, the Philistines and the Arabians and the Amorites had been brought under, under subjection. He had ruled for 52 years, and as a nation, under his leadership, under his control, under his authority, Israel had enjoyed many liberties and many freedom, freedoms that other nations had not yet not enjoyed. But then something happens to stop us in our tracks, just like it happened in Isaiah's day. And what happened was that this king died. And death brings change. Death brings change. And every one of us now, we, every one of us can associate here with this man called Isaiah. Because we know the changes it brings. We know the, sometimes the loss that it brings. We know sometimes the heartache that it brings. But things will never be the same again. And I'm convinced in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is very aware of that. Things are going to be different in Israel. Things are going to be different with this nation. Why? Because for 52 years, this king has let them enjoy their liberties and freedoms. But there's going to be a new king. And what will this new king bring? Will he cut off our liberties? Will he cut off our freedoms? Will he lead us? Will he cause us to be a people like what it was like whenever we were back in the house of bondage in Egypt, whereby that we were, we were like slaves? Were, and... And he, it's at this point that God reveals himself to Isaiah. And I ask myself, why is it at this strategic point in, 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 the, in, the, in the history of, of, of Israel does the Lord reveal himself to Isaiah? I'll tell you why. Well, this is, I'm going to tell you, this is what I believe is the reason why. Because there's a possibility whenever King Isaiah dies, Isaiah is anxious. Isaiah is fretful of the future. Isaiah is conscious that there's a, a new king going to be appointed, and, and his concern is not for himself, but is his concern is for the people of God. And he only wants what's best for them. He doesn't want to see this nation go back into bondage. He doesn't want to see this nation losing its liberties. He doesn't want to see this nation going backward instead of forward. And so Isaiah is maybe possibly in his mind mulling all these things over. That is until the Lord reveals himself to him. And the Lord teaches Isaiah a very important lesson. And that lesson, good people, he continually teaches us as his people. What is the lesson? Very simple as good people. Don't put your trust in kings. Don't put your trust in resources because one day they'll dry up. Don't put your trust in people because sometimes people let you down. But put your trust in the Lord your God. Can you identify with Isaiah? Because I can. Have people let me down? Sadly they have. Have I let people down? Sadly to my shame I most likely have. Has there been times when resources have been, should we say, less than generous? Yes they have. Has there been time whenever change has come into my life? Yes there has. 
And yet there has been one, you could say, line that has never changed on the journey of life. And that line points me to none other than the Lord God Almighty that reminds me he is the faithful one that does not change. He remains the same. And our trust must not be in nothing else and in no one else, but except in him. The problem is if our trust is in resources, they can dry up. If our trust is in people, they can let us down. If our trust is even in kings, they can one day die. But our God, our God remains the same. A few months ago, I was going to help a friend one morning and I rose at, I rose at half four to get out of bed and lo and behold, for some unknown reason to me, but my, my back just simply locked in the very spot. I was somewhere halfway up and halfway down. You remember the old story like Humpty Dumpty? He's neither up the hill nor down the hill. Well, that was just like me on the side of the bed. I was neither in the bed nor out of the bed. And I had a shout at the, well, the wife wasn't too far away. She usually sleeps right and close to me. But uh, I had a shout and say, look, darling, you're going to have to do something. I says, what's wrong? I says, I can't move. And I'm not joking, folks. I couldn't move. I couldn't touch the floor. I could do nothing. I couldn't get back into bed. I couldn't get up. I couldn't stand. I could do none of these things. And for a wee month or two, for, well, I'm sure for at least as I, as I sat there, I said, what am I going to do? This man's expecting me. This man's expecting me to come, and I can't not let him down. We had a, had a wee job only one a bit of a hand. I said, can't let the man down. But I couldn't get out of bed. And then, folks, whenever things sort of settled down, I, I drove down to help him, but I couldn't even... I was trying to lift a grip to grip a bit of grass for him. I couldn't even lift, I could hardly lift the grip. I was sort of like a useless, absolutely stone useless in that day. And then, as it were, just in the quietness of my heart, over time God spoke to me and reminded me of what happened that day. And it very simply reminded me, said this, Nigel, you can't do anything without me. You can't even get out of bed without me. And that was very true. Because it didn't matter how much I tried that morning, I, I wasn't going anywhere or I wasn't doing anything. I was neither lying nor sitting nor standing nor running. I could neither do anything. I was just like, for a few minutes, I was just like crippled in one place, in one position. That was me stuck. And I realized, folks, sometimes we put an awful lot of dependency upon the flesh. Oh, Lord, I can do this. I don't need your help to do this, Lord. I, I, can, I can run the children's work. I can run the youth work. I can do this. I can preach. I can do... And the Lord says, you can't do any of it unless I let you. The Lord says, you can't do any of it unless I let you. And that morning, I learned a very important lesson. Lord, I can't even raise you out of my bed in the morning unless you let me. Because my trust must be in you. My dependency must be in you. And Father, forgive me. Lord, forgive me when for so long I try to do it on my own. In the strength of me rather than the strength of God. Tell me today, very simply, as I bring this service to a close, our time is gone. Let me ask you today, in the honesty of your own heart, where is your trust today? Where is your trust today? Maybe you're visiting in Kilkeel Baptist. Maybe you've come from another church. I see some visitors here, and some that I know of. But you mean maybe you're wondering your future. However, here in the church, you say to yourself, Lord, uh, you mean you've blessed us with a good pastor, but Lord, help us not to trust in our pastor. Help us to support him. Help us to stand by him. Help us to give him as much faithfulness and loyalty as it's possible for a congregation to give to their pastor. But Lord, help us not to put our trust in him. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord.
Where is your trust today? Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe you have a wayward child, a wayward son or daughter. Maybe you are that wayward child. Maybe you are that wayward son. And like the prodigal, you've squandered your life's goods, squandered your life on things that have brought no fruit whatsoever to your life. For a time they brought pleasure, but today you sit miserable in church. You're not the last one that has sat miserable in the church. You're not the first, and you're definitely not the last. But the day that prodigal son came to his senses, when the day when he realized that even his father's servants were far better off than he was. And the thing I, the thing that I relish most about the pro, this message, the story of the prodigal son, was whenever the son came home, the father neither condemned him, nor neither judged him, nor neither gave him an awful tongue because he wasted. Now bear in mind, the father had to sell half of his belongings, so he might give him his share, and then he went away and threw it all away. You imagine now you've worked hard and imagine you're the son who takes all his half, half of what you own and takes away and spends away in Christ's level. You can only imagine how you might feel. And yet this father, he's son, and all he do is he, he just welcomes him back, throws his arms around him and he says, welcome home. Can I say something? I don't know what your, perspe- or your understanding is of fatherhood or, or having a father, but I'm telling you, there is no father like our heavenly father who loves us with such an immense love despite who we are and what we have done. He's ready to forgive. He's ready to pardon. And he's ready to welcome us into the family. Where is your trust today? Let's pray. Gracious God, we ask you this morning in Jesus' name, to put our trust in you today. And maybe even those who sit in this house of God have not yet trusted thee for salvation, that even today, Lord, that they would call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, for those of us who are your children today, we need your help. Forgive us when we've tried you so much, even our day-to-day activities, those skills that you've given us whereby we've, we've relied on our own ability rather than relying on you. Forgive us, Lord, and even help people to see despite how skilled that you might have made us, that even then people might see still as blessed as they are that our, their trust, this people, their trust is still in the Lord their God. Father, bless this congregation and especially Pastor George and his wife, who have these few days of break, refresh them and renew them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Four, six, five in our hands.